I want to turn to your book uh, because that's why I'm having you here today, The Four Pillars of Investing. This book came out 20 years ago. I read it then. It was, it's become a bit of an investment classic. Before I get to the four pillars, I want to let the viewers know you were a very early proponent of indexing. You were one of the championship champions of that. Uh, you have generally argued against stock picking and market timing. Uh, is there anything that's happened in the last 21 years uh, that has altered your, your, your fundamental views on this? Uh, the only thing that's happened is I'm now 20 years older, and I would like to think I've acquired some useful experience. Uh, and one of the things that I acquired and, and, and learned both in 2008 and more recently during the March 2020 COVID uh, swoon was that how you behave in the worst 2% of the markets probably describes 90% of your overall investment performance because compound interest is magic. And the prime directive of compound interest, as Charlie Munger famously said, is to never interrupt it. And yeah. so that you should design your portfolio with those 2% of the world's 2% of the world in mind. Yeah, that's a very good point. Let's go over the four principles because it's important. You've got a, a book title, Four Principles. Let's say what the four principles are. Uh, so number one here is uh, the four principles of investing. Number one is theory here. Risk and return are joined at the hip. The higher risk, you get higher return. If you desire safety, you have to accept lower returns. So the, that's the theory behind this. And of course, a lot of people understand this intellectually. They don't necessarily do it, though. That's that's right. I couldn't have said it better uh, myself. Uh, so that you know, risk and return are joined at the hip. And if you want uh, perfectly uh, perfectly safe portfolio, you're not going to have high returns. Uh, and if you want the high returns that come with equities, then you're going to have to sustain bone crushing losses. Hopefully, they will be temporary from time to time. And basically, you don't get those stock returns for free. You have to uh, pay for it with stomach acid. All right. Number two of the four principle of investing is the, the history part of this, and that is the market's uh, overshoot on the upside and the downside. But there's only so many plot trajectories. Now, what do you mean by that, Bill, when you say there's only so, only so many plot trajectories? What's the takeaway for an investor to say markets overshoot on the upside and, and downside? Well, markets don't get either very expensive or very cheap without a good reason. So at market bottoms, uh, everybody likes to say that, you know, we're gonna, I'm gonna buy at the market bottom, but you don't know where that is except in retrospect. And the narratives at market bottoms are really scary. It looked like in the end of 2008 that our entire financial system was collapsing. Uh, it looked like in 20, early 2020, like there were going to be tens of millions of worldwide debts in the markets uh, uh, and the economies of the world were going to completely shut down. And remember that in March of 2020, there was no vaccine in sight. All right. Yeah. So the world looked, looked very scary then. So you have to just be able to uh, keep your discipline and understand that the market, expected market return has to do with the perceived risk of the market and the perceived risk of the environment that you're in. So when the risks seem very high and seem things, things, very, things seem very scary, then you have to be paid with a high expected return to compensate for that risk. Yeah. Uh, let's move on. This is uh, investing pillar number three here, and that's the psychology part uh, of all of this. Uh, you are your own worst enemy, one of my favorite lines uh, from, from, from you, uh, which is true. This goes through behavioral psychology, and people don't buy low and sell high. They do the opposite. Uh, and investors tend to be overconfident about their ability to pick stocks and about their own risk tolerance. There's a lot in here, but you, I want to start with that point about they're overconfident about their ability to to pick stocks. If there's anything that you stood for and, and, and a number of other uh, people out there, it's that market timing generally does not work and picking stocks doesn't work over investing in indexes. Um, the academic literature is pretty overwhelming on this, Bill. And, and um, how do we keep emphasizing this to the new generation, I guess? Well, you tell people a couple of things. In the first place, whenever you buy or sell a stock, the guy on the other side of the trade isn't some dentist from Peoria who doesn't know what he's doing, all right? It's generally that person on the other side of the trade generally has a name like Warren Buffett or Goldman Sachs, and that's not even the worst case scenario. Uh, 
The worst case scenario is that you're trading with the CFO of the corporation who knows more about it than anybody else on the planet. And the analogy I like to use, or the metaphor I like to use, is you're playing tennis against an invisible opponent. And what you don't understand is the person on the other side of the net is Serena Williams. All right. So that's that's the main thing. Now, the other thing has yep. to do with timing the market. And all you have to do is just look at the history of newsletters and market timers to see that no one, and I mean no one, consistently calls the market with even 60 or 70 percent accuracy. More closely, more more likely, it's more like 30 to 50 percent, which is worse than a coin flip. Right. And by the way, you have to you have to hit 70 percent to win because not only do you have to decide when to get out, but you have to decide when to get in. When to get in. And the math yeah. of that's yeah. And the math says you have to be right about 70 percent of the time you do both of those. Right things successfully and right. no one does that it comes even close right uh, you also said investors are overconfident on their risk tolerance that that's very interesting and this ties in what you said earlier uh, how you behave in the worst two percent determines what you're going to do so it turns out people are risk tolerant until the market's down 30 percent and then all of a sudden they're they're less risk tolerant H how do you convey that how do you make that into something real for somebody well, I quote that famous financial economist, Mike Tyson, who said that everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. So the bottom line is, I think the simple way to do this is prepare yourself for, like last year, the market was down 20 percent. Most people were very, very worried. And I got lots of emails. So we pull money out and I say, you know, if you were a long term investor, this year is not going to matter in the next next 20 years. I think that's the key point here. Let me just move on here and go to four pillars of investing number four, and that's understanding the investment business and who you're dealing with. Uh, the primary business of most fund companies is collecting assets. It's not managing the money. That's very profound. Assets under management is what matters, not necessarily managing the money. Uh, and pay close attention to fund fees. And of course, this was Bogle, Jack Bogle's central insight that even when you get a fund manager who might have some alpha that's often destroyed by the fact that their fees are, 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 are too high here. So um, I think a lot of people have absorbed this um, idea, Bill. I mean, this is one of the reasons ETFs have proven so popular. Um, how do you feel about the ETF business and it, 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 its role in reducing fees, for example? Generally pretty positive. Uh, one can purchase a lot of investment products now uh, for next to nothing in terms of expenses, a couple of basis points. Uh, and, you know, this was, you know, Jack Vogel wasn't wrong about very many things, but he was wrong about his opposition uh, to ETFs. And uh, thank goodness that uh, Gus Sauter was able to convince him and the Vanguard Group to uh, go ahead with their ETF offerings. Yeah, the very few things Jack was wrong on. He was wrong about that. And Jack thought there was going to be too much trading around ETFs. And there is, uh, but the benefits far outweigh anything else. Matt, I, you've been sitting there quietly. Any thoughts on this? Uh, the, the academic literature certainly supports the idea that market timing and going in and out of stocks is a bad idea. But there's a whole new young generation of traders, particularly since COVID, who seem to love doing this. They love doing options, too. Um, Matt, how do you convey Bill's wisdom in history without those younger people saying, you know, you guys are all a bunch of old fogies. Doesn't matter that much anymore. What, what, any advice, Matt? You've been around a while. Great question, and it is true wisdom. It's extremely true. You know, indexing always appeals to the head, but there's always a part of people's heart that thinks they can time the market. My hope for people is they put the vast majority of their portfolio in low-cost index funds and buy and hold. And if they have to have a small portion that they try to time the market and learn those lessons individually, that's fine. But protect the bulk of your assets in low cost index funds for the long haul. It's extremely good wisdom. And Bill, what do you say to people when GameStop happened? People messaged me immediately and said, aha, you see, this proves fundamentals don't matter. The company's not making any money. It doesn't look like it's going to make any money. Look at the price of this. This crazy thing, it makes no sense at all on a fundamental basis. Uh, and ultimately, of course, those of us who are fundamental investors believe that long term that this will play out. But you have to admit, short term, they can certainly make things a little crazy. What's the correct response to people who say, well, look at GameStop. Fundamentals don't matter that much anymore. Yeah, almost 100 years ago, my father kept trying to convince uh, 
uh, my grand my grandfather uh, to invest in in stocks during the 1920s, and he he just kept saying, "No, son, I'm not going to do it." And then finally, my father, in exasperation, looked at him and said, "Why, Dad? Shouldn't I invest in stocks?" And then he just said, "You'll see." And of course, 1929 happened, and that was that was the answer. And so that's my that's my that's my response to people who are enthusiastic about meme stocks: is just wait a few years, you'll see. Well, so you broke up a little bit there, Bill, but your, your point was what, this craziness happened in the 1920s, too, and eventually fundamentals caught up with everybody. Is that, that was the point? Exactly. Right? Yeah, that, that was the point. It was, it was just a story of my, between my father and my grandfather. My grandfather finally, in exasperation, looked at my father and said, just wait for a few years in the 1920s, and you'll see what happens to all these high-flying stocks. Yeah, well, my response has always been, the reason people buy stocks is to participate in a future stream of dividends or, or potential earnings that would turn into dividends. And I am not aware of any reason why that has changed over the years. Um, but you can get groups of people to suddenly believe in other things. I, do you, I don't know if you remember, Bill, but in the 1980s and 1990s, we used to have on a fellow, Arch Crawford, who used to buy, recommend buying stocks based on astrology. So the, the, the moon was in Venus by Microsoft, literally like that. And we all sort of said, you've got to be kidding me here at CNBC 30 years ago. But he had a very large following of people. And obviously, this had nothing to do at all with the fundamentals. But I guess my point here is, if you could convince a sufficiently large number of traders to suddenly believe in sunspot activity and that was going to affect something, I guess you can move stocks for, for a while. But ultimately, you got to go back to fundamentals somewhere. Yeah, I mean, that's called data mining. There's, you can always find spurious correlations. The most famous example of that was about 20 or 30 years ago, somebody uh, figured out uh, that when he plumbed the um, United Nations Economic Database, that butter production in Bangladesh precisely predicted uh, the um, movement of the S&P 500. Well, if you're looking at 100,000 different parameters, you're liable to find one that's very accurate. But of course, there's no guarantee that's going to do terribly well going forward. Yeah, or that there's even any correlation there, that it's any but statistical anomaly there.